All right, well, why don't we get started? Uh, I'm Louis Gadima. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for AppSembler, and uh, Nate Oni, who's the uh, founder and CEO of uh, AppSembler, is, of course, with us also. He's going to be uh, doing a presentation uh, on open edX and interoperability. Uh, I know we call this a 15-minute webinar. There's an awful lot to cover here. We may go a little bit longer on the webinar part of it. Uh, the initial presentation, but you're still going to get a chance to ask questions at the end. So uh, please just use the questions panel in the GoToWebinar uh, interface, and you can submit questions to us, and then um, Nate will be answering those questions at the end. Normally, we have another webinar. Uh, we have a webinar every month, uh, the second week of the month, and I know these have gotten pretty popular and really appreciate how many of you are uh, joining us for these. However, next month is the Open edX conference, so um, that's going to be at Stanford uh, the second week of the month. So rather than doing a webinar, uh, we're going to be at that conference, and we hope that a lot of you will join us at the conference also. So, uh, and uh, at the end of this also, uh, we do ask two questions uh, at the very end of the webinar. So uh, when you're signing off, if you could just answer those two really quick questions, it would be really helpful for us. So again, thanks for joining us, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nate now uh, to make the presentation on open edX and interoperability, and please uh, submit your questions in the uh, questions panel, and we'll get to those at the end. Great. Thanks, Louis, um, and thank you all for joining today. Um, <clears throat> we're going to, uh, obviously, we're going to be talking about interoperability and how to make open edX play nicely with other systems um, but before we dive into the meat of the, the session today I want to say a few words about who is AppSembler and uh, what is open edX for those of you who aren't familiar um, and then uh, as Louis said we're going to have to, we're going to take questions at the end so be thinking about some good questions to ask all right um, so AppSembler is a leading open edX solutions provider um, that means that we provide the customization implementation hosting and support um, around the open edX software platform um, we're headquartered um, just down the street from edX in Cambridge um, and we have a whole bunch of uh, customers that um, we've been working with over the last couple of years um, and we also are always eager to find new customers, so if, if you're interested in talking with us about your Open edX needs, uh, feel free to reach out. So what is Open edX? Uh, open edX is a free and open source uh, course management system that you can use to author and deliver online courses. Uh, and the platform is, is being used all over the world to deliver engaging learning experiences. Uh, you may have seen this Powered by Open edX logo in the lower right-hand corner. So. If you come across a website um, that has a really great uh, learning system, chances are it's being powered by Open edX. Um, so I'm going to talk about some different ways that you can integrate Open edX with other systems. Um, so depending on what type of integration you're trying to do, there are various means of doing it. Um, we covered many of the X blocks that are available for Open edX in a previous webinar, which I encourage you to go back and, and check out. Um, Open edX also supports LTI. Um, which is a standard way of um, allowing different educational technology software tools to talk to each other. Um, and there's, there's other uh, standards, out, standards out there like SCORM, TinCan, XAPI, and an, a new emerging standard called H5P. Um, <clears throat> there's also um, single sign-on support that OpenEdX provides that allows you to let your, your users, your students, your instructors to be able to log in using their existing um, account, whether that's um, on Google or maybe it's Active Directory or, or Shibboleth or Office 365. Um, there are also a whole range of APIs that allow you to do things like programmatic enrollment of students in courses, um, syndicating the course catalog, um, building mobile apps, and we're going to talk about a few of those today. Um, <clears throat> a really common way of integrating um, other software inside a website is using a JavaScript widget. So the most common one is like Google Analytics, um, but we're also going to talk about Intercom and Segment is also one of the, uh, the JavaScript widgets that allows you to embed a whole range of different uh, tools inside your OpenEdX site. 
Um, and then, of course, there's the raw data dump. If you want to get access to the raw data, um, because OpenEdX is open source, you have access to the MySQL database, which is where all the student data is stored. You have access to the MongoDB database, which is where all the course content is stored. And then there's the, raw, the tracking logs that are on the file system, which include uh, information about every mouse click, every, every interaction or activity the student does in the system is recorded. And you can take that data and integrate it with other analytics tools that you might use. Um, and lastly, um, you can always customize the software. Um, because it's open source, um, you can integrate it with other tools like uh, Salesforce, Marketo, Infusionsoft are a few of the, the ones that we're going to talk about today. So um, now I'm going to talk about some examples of integration. Um, the default way of embedding video uh, on your OpenEdX site is using YouTube, um, but there are several other methods if you don't want to use YouTube. Um, there's a X block for Brightcove, for Uyala, for Wistia. You can also put your videos up on S3 and, and serve them up securely uh, using IP restriction. Um, if you're delivering this content to um, other countries, you may want to have uh, make use of CDNs uh, to deliver the content faster with less latency. So uh, you can integrate OpenEdX with uh, CDNs like Amazon's CloudFront or Akamai. Um, you might also want to provide uh, real-time video chat capabilities inside your OpenEdX site. And edX has uh, built-in support for Google Hangouts. Uh, we've also done integration with Big Blue Button, which is a, a web video conferencing, uh, open source web video conferencing software. Um, and there's also ways to do it using WebEx and GoToMeeting. Um, as we mentioned before, you can easily embed Google Analytics on your OpenEdX site. Um, and using Segment, there's a whole range of other analytics tools that you can plug in very seamlessly. Um, we have one customer that's using something called uh, Adobe Site Catalyst, and um, pretty much the sky's the limit. Any kind of analytics tool can be uh, integrated with edX. Um, CRMs, um, you might have your your customers or your users living in another system like Salesforce, HubSpot, Infusionsoft, or Intercom. And we're going to show a few ways of how you can integrate with those other systems. And some of those same systems also provide marketing automation like Marketo, Intercom, and HubSpot also have ways that you can, you can message your, your customers or, or your users depending on things they have or haven't done inside the software. And then lastly, if you're not happy with the, uh, the built-in forms that edX provides, which are very capable, um, you can integrate with another uh, forum software like Discourse or Piazza. And um, if you're curious about that, we can, we can point you in the direction of, of those uh, integrations. Um, there's another slide about other integrations. Um, so some of you have also expressed interest in adaptive learning. Um, so you can now integrate um, a sort of flashcard, adaptive learning flashcard software called Cerigo um, via LTI. And there are also integrations with Newton and SmartSparrow, which are third-party adaptive learning um, service providers. Um, the big companies like Google and Microsoft have also invested in building uh, X blocks that allow you to embed uh, like your Google Drive documents, your Google Docs or spreadsheets uh, or your Google Calendar right within your Open edX course. Um, and Microsoft has also created the Microsoft Office Mix X block, which lets you embed very interactive presentations based on PowerPoint. Um, <clears throat> the default uh, e-commerce plugin um, that's used or payment processor is called Cybersource, but you can also integrate Stripe or PayPal. Uh, we also have customers that are using Magento. Um, and we're doing integrations between the Magento e-commerce software platform and OpenEdX. You might also have um, some of your content living in another LMS, like Moodle, Canvas, or Saba. And we're going to show some ways how you can um, take the content that lives in those systems and pull them into edX and vice versa. If you have content in edX and you want to pull it into uh, another LMS, there's ways of doing that using LTI. Um, there's also... Uh, different reporting capabilities. The, the most simple is just using something like Microsoft Excel where you get the raw data and you can pull that into Excel and, and do uh, different analysis inside Excel. Uh, we also have customers using Power BI, which is a Microsoft tool. Uh, MIT uses BigQuery to do reporting. Um, and we have another customer that's using uh, Hadoop to do uh, a lot of their reporting on student. 
progress. So uh, I want to talk about embedding content or reusing content that lives in, an, in, in another uh, software application. Um, so we have one customer who had a lot of content in a legacy Drupal site, and so they did a database dump, and then they wrote scripts to convert that raw data into uh, what's called OLX, which is the Open Learning XML. Um, that's the native format for embedding, uh, or, or uh, it's, it's the native format for course content in OpenEdX. And then once that content was in the native format, it could seamlessly be imported into OpenEdX using the provided import course feature. Uh, another way that you might um, be able to import, uh, or sorry, embed content would be using an iframe. So there's an iframe X block. So if that content lives on some other page on the web, um, you can very seamlessly just embed that content right in your OpenEdX course using an iframe. Um, you can also um, include custom JavaScript applications using something called JS input. Um, <clears throat> and you can also set up the JavaScript app so that the learner's interactions are graded inside uh, OpenEdX. Um, let's say that you want to use a SCORM-based e-learning content from a legacy LMS in OpenEdX. Um, we're not going to cover SCORM today, but I do want to mention that we're building a SCORM X block for a customer right now, uh, which we plan to be uh, making available in the coming months. Um, the other scenario is that you have content that lives in another system, and for whatever reason you want to keep that uh, content in that system, um, or you want some capability that OpenEdX doesn't provide out of the box, but you have you found a third-party provider that does have that capability. Well, if that provider can expose the content or the exercises uh, as an LTI tool, then OpenEdX, um, because it's an LTI consumer, can embed that content in the OpenEdX course. And we're going to show a few examples of that. Um, but first, this is a basic diagram of how LTI works. So in this case, the blue um, LMS is OpenEdX, and the orange app is the LTI component. And so the student uses the app right within the OpenEdX course, and then that app um, provides the interactive exercise or the content, and then it can send the, the grades back to OpenEdX um, for recording purposes. And the student never realizes that they're using this external system because it's seamless. It all happens within the context of the OpenEdX site. Um, so here's uh, an example of that flashcard tool that I mentioned before called Cerigo. Um, and here we're embedding it directly in the OpenEdX course. And because we're using LTI, the student doesn't need to log into Cerigo. And all the student's activity is passed back into edX to record their grade on this exercise. So the reverse is also true. OpenEdX can be an LTI provider, meaning that it can expose OpenEdX content and exercises to an external LMS. So in this screenshot, we're looking at a Canvas course, um, which is another LMS, um, and there smack dab in the middle of the course is a video from an OpenEdX course um, that's being displayed in place. Um, so this is all done through the power of LTI. So now I want to talk about programmatic enrollment. Um, so the most common way for learners to enroll in an OpenEdX course is to browse to the course info page. We've all seen this page before if we're familiar with OpenEdX. Uh, the student clicks on the Enroll button, and then they're enrolled in the course. Um, but what if you're showing the courses on your main website or in an e-commerce site, and this, so when the student purchases the course on that other site, you want to automatically enroll them in the OpenEdX course? Well, this can be done using the enrollment API that OpenEdX provides. So one of our customers, the Body Mind Institute, had such an e-commerce site. And when the user buys a course, that activity is sent to another piece of software called Infusionsoft. We're looking at Infusionsoft right now. And Infusionsoft then kicks off a bunch of automated actions, um, one of which is to enroll that student um, in the course that they just purchased. So here you can see that we are calling um, a special API endpoint that we created to enroll the user in a course. Uh, in this case, the, that course is EP01 Evergreen course. And this particular capability is very popular <laughs> as we're now uh, working with another customer to do this from Saba and yet another customer to do this from Magento. Um, so we expect to, to be doing a lot more work around you know, extending the enrollment API to be uh, more capable. So for many companies, their customers either live in another system like a CRM, um, like Salesforce, 
Um, and replicating all those customers in OpenNX and defining which customers, uh, or sorry, which courses those customers can see um, and can't see is a lot of work. Uh, so one of our customers, Metalogix, had this challenge, and in particular, they wanted to be able to show um, different courses to the user depending on whether that user was an employee, a customer, or a partner. So they put all this information into Salesforce about you know, who their customers are and you know, whether they're a, a customer or a partner or employee. And then we built uh, a new course access group feature for edX um, that lets the course author define which roles should, should be able to view the course. So when a user registers, our code checks with Salesforce to determine which group they should be assigned to based on the domain in their email address. So I illustrate it using this very crude diagram that I made. Um, so this simple diagram is showing uh, the interaction between OpenEdX and Salesforce. So when the user fills out the registration form on the OpenEdX site, um, their email address is passed to Salesforce, and there's a lookup um, that happens to determine whether that user is an employee, a customer, or a partner. And if there's a match in the database, um, then the proper role is returned to OpenEdX, and the user is assigned that role. And then based on that role, that restricts which courses um, they can and cannot see in the catalog. Uh, we also have another project underway with a large state university to integrate uh, Salesforce with OpenEdX. Um, but with this customer, we're also going to be storing information in Salesforce about course completion and student activities. So it's a well-known fact that MOOCs have very poor completion rates, and many corporate training uh, also suffers from low completion rates. So we're talking with a lot of companies who are struggling with how to keep learners engaged. Um, and they poke and they prod them to continue with the course they started. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to show a couple examples of, of how we've um, we built uh, integrations with uh, third-party tools to help keep um, these students motivated to continue doing the coursework. Um, so one of our customers is Inner Systems, and they developed a, a custom learning path, um, which is a course of study spanning seven courses. And their aim was to tailor email communications to these learning path participants based on their progress through this, these self-paced courses. Um, <clears throat> and really what they're trying to do is urge those who've completed a course to continue to the next course and to send reminders to students who hadn't recently visited a course. So the way we did this was using a marketing automation software called Marketo. Uh, um, and so open edX students have a corresponding lead in Marketo with fields that are storing their participation in the learning path. So we have stored completion status of each of the seven courses and the last access date to each course. And so there's a trigger in Marketo that fires a welcome email when they first enroll in the learning path. And then there's another trigger in Marketo that fires a reminder email after a certain number of days since the last recorded access date. So we're tracking when the student logs in, when they access the course, and if they haven't accessed the course within a certain number of days, then we send them a reminder. And then we send another uh, email at the end, um, a, a congratulations email, to tell them to continue to the next course when they complete the first course. Um, we have another customer called Aquient, and they have a website called Gymnasium, which has a whole bunch of uh, free MOOC courses for designers. And <clears throat> when you log into the, the site, um, they can optionally send messages to the students. So you can see over here on the right, Jeremy is saying, hi, Mike, we're excited to present Designing for Learning, a live event featuring Writing for Web. Click below to sign in and add this event to your calendar. So they're able to do in-app messaging to their users, and they know who these people are. They know what courses they've taken. They know uh, whether they've completed those courses. They know a little bit about the student, where they live. And so they're able to do these in-app messages to really kind of um, coax them along and get them to do things that they want them to do. And if they're not logged in, these messages can also be sent out via email. Um, so this is what the kind of reporting dashboard looks like for that campaign that Jeremy launched. So he sent that to 9,648 people, 7% opened it, 1% clicked, um, and he can also set up goals, he can find out how many people reply to that, um, <clears throat> and he can also uh, create a sort of criteria about who should see that message inside Intercom. So this is a really powerful tool, we also use Intercom, um, and it's very easy to integrate. I'm going to show you how easy it is in the next slide. So this is the, the, um, 
the JavaScript snippet of code um, that is put into the theme-google-analytics.html file. This is in our edX theme. And you can see here that um, we add this the same way you would add a Google Analytics widget. Here we're just checking to see that the user is authenticated so we don't show the intercom widget to anonymous users. Then we send uh, intercom the user's name, the email, the user ID, and the date that the user was created uh, so that we can track all this information on the intercom side. So all this data just comes out of edX and it goes in intercom and then you can use intercom's tools to do the messaging and reporting and uh, all the kind of up upsell activities. Um, so you might also have a main website and you want the courses on your open edX site to be listed on your main website. Um, or maybe you have an e-commerce site um, but you don't want to have to type in all the course information a second time. So we're going to talk about how to do that. Um, but first I'm going to show you a couple examples. So this is the courses page on edX.org. Um, we get a lot of people asking us for the same course discovery experience that you find on edX.org. How can you blame them? This faceted search works great. Uh, what most people don't realize is that the main edX.org website is not an open edX site. It's a Drupal site. Um, so when you're browsing or searching for courses, you're actually interfacing with Drupal, and it's not until you click to enroll in a course that you're taken over to the open edX site. And you'll notice that the URL will change from edX, www.edX.org to courses.edX.org. That's the indication that you're now on the open edX site. Um, and incidentally, open edX itself has a faceted search feature uh, like the one you see on edX.org, but it requires a bit of configuration to get it working like the one on edX. Um, <clears throat> so this is another site. Um, it's openedu.ru. Uh, you probably notice that it's not the English alphabet. This is Russian Cyrillic. Um, and this is a handcrafted site which is pulling in all the courses from their open edX site. So this is not an open edX site. It's actually just a, a static HTML site um, built with Twitter Bootstrap. How do I know this? Well, if you hang out on the Open edX Slack community, uh, you find out all, all kinds of interesting things. So back in December, uh, Sergey uh, popped into the channel to say that he was from the openedu.ru uh, team. And after some poking around, we discovered that his main site was not, in fact, an Open edX site, but he was displaying all the courses from his Open edX site. How is openedX.org and openedu.ru doing this? Are they double entering all of this data? In the case of edX.org, that would be 980 courses. Well, no. The way they're doing it is by using the provided course discovery API, which allows you to query the course catalog programmatically and use the response to pull that course catalog info into any other system. So if you have a browser tab open right now, you can go to this URL, courses.edX.org slash API slash courses slash v1 slash courses and you can see a list of all the courses on edX.org uh, and as a JSON response. Um, this and incidentally this is also the same API that the iOS and the Android apps use uh, to pull those courses down onto your phone. So I also want to uh, let you know that we do these free webinars roughly once per month. Um, the first two were uh, Ask Nate Anything or ANA for short. Uh, we did one in March on Xbox with uh, special guest uh, Ned Batchelder, the creator of Xbox who works at edX. Last month we did one on Dogwood. Um, we're going to skip the one uh, next month because of the Open edX conference. And then in July we'll likely do one on Eucalyptus which is the next release of Open edX. So we encourage you to um, to check out the past webinars. We have some blog posts on our website that have the full recording as well as um, a transcript of, of all the questions that were asked. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to invite all of you to the conference next month at Stanford where I'm going to be giving a 40 minute version of this webinar. So I'm going to be going into much more depth, much more examples, um, and we'll have more time for questions. So I, I highly encourage any of you who are into open edX to, to come to the, uh, the beautiful Stanford University campus June 14th um, to meet other people in the open edX community and, and hear a lot of really great talks. Um, and with that, I want to open it up for questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nate. Um, as we said, uh, it was going to be a little longer than 15 minutes because uh, there was so much to cover there. And even that doesn't uh, <clears throat> begin to cover all the possibilities. Uh, wow, there's a, that's a big advantage of having an open source system that uh, 
you can uh, tie into in so many ways. Uh, one thing I do want to mention to people is there is a handout uh, for this webinar also. So if you look in the, the GoToWebinar panel under handouts, uh, there's a case study of uh, the integration that we did with Salesforce for Met Metalogics. So uh, you're welcome to uh, download that. So uh, here's, uh, let's start with just a couple questions because we are getting near uh, the end of the half hour. But one question is, is uh, the courses discovery API enabled by default? And is it only available in Dogwood? Um, which, sorry, which API? The course enrollment API? Course discovery API. Oh, the course discovery API. Yeah, so there was um, a recent change um, from the course structure API to the course discovery API. And the course structure API was deprecated in favor of the new course discovery API. And I'm not sure when that happened, if, if that happened between Cypress and Dogwood. Um, <clears throat> but it should be fairly easy to see if you go and check the documentation. It, it should tell you which API is being used with, with uh, which version of OpenEdX. Okay. Um, so you mentioned um, integration with Google Hangouts for live video conferencing. Um, so that kind of existed for a while, and then did it go away, and now it's back? Yeah, so Google changed um, the Google Hangouts API, which broke the integration um, with the JavaScript widget that that OpenEdX was using to embed that, and I believe that it's it's been fixed because I saw recently on the uh, the, the edX code mailing list that there's some talk uh, there was some talk that um, that it's now working. I haven't tested it myself, but um, there was some some discussion around using the Hangouts on Air capabilities, which allows you to broadcast to more than ten people. So by default, Google Hangouts has a limit of only ten participants, but if you use Hangouts on Air, which um, which does the streaming through YouTube, I think it's unlimited participants. You can stream to as many people as you want. Okay. Um, uh, the question about uh, <clears throat> well uh, about uh, Adobe Connect. Do you know if there's any plans for integrating Adobe Connect? Um, we've we've talked to some customers that are using Adobe Connect, but we haven't actually seen any integrations yet. Um, so so yeah, I don't have any more I don't have any more information about that. Okay. So it's not within uh, OpenEdX in the way that Big Blue Button or Google Hangouts or some of these others uh, are. I mean if if Adobe Connect can uh, expose the interface via LTI then um, then I, I imagine it would wouldn't be any more difficult than using uh, you know, doing it the same way that we did it with Big Blue Button. Okay. Um, you know, just a, such an amazing range of integrations that you touched on. Uh, one question here about uh, mentioning Hadoop. Uh, were you referring to the uh, edX Insights product that uses Hadoop? Yeah, so Insights is, is a good example of um, <clears throat> using Hadoop to join data sources, you know, there's like three different data sources, right? There's MySQL, there's MongoDB, and there are the tracking logs. And what Hadoop allows you to do is to ingest all that data, send it up to Hadoop to run uh, queries and join all these different data sources and then send back the resulting data set uh, to the Insights software. Um, in my example, I was actually talking about uh, a customer uh, who, who uses Hadoop for a lot of things. Um, and so you know, in their mind, just getting access to the raw data makes a lot more sense than using the Insight software because they, they have Hadoop expertise. So um, that's one of the beauties of OpenEdX is that you have access to the raw data and you can use that with whatever other systems that, you, that you're already using to give you sort of like a 360-degree view of your users or your customers. Okay. Have you, have you heard of Firefox Hello? for uh, video and voice uh, conversations? I have not. Okay. It's a big world out there. <laughs> um, one person asked about that as uh, another possible alternative to, to Big Blue Button or Google Hangouts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's kind of a, a, an endless world, but uh, 
you know, I guess you'd say that almost anything can be integrated if it has, uh, if it's open with an API. Uh, if it hasn't been already, it, it, it could be. Uh, See, there's a question about discourse here. Yeah. Um, so we haven't actually done an integration with discourse. We do have a test instance of discourse running. Uh, and I've seen integrations between discourse and like WordPress. Um, <coughs> There's a company in, I think they're in Switzerland, called Ionis. Um, their instance is Ionis X, and they've done an integration with Discourse. And there's a, a plugin on their GitHub account that uh, supposedly integrates edX with Discourse, but I have not yet tried it. Um, but I'd be happy to share that in the notes after the webinar if um, I think Sujan is the one who asked that question. Uh, yeah. I'm happy to shoot the link to that if you want to check it out. All right, let's take one more question, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, can you say something more about the tracking log mentioned in the earlier slides? <clears throat> sure. So if, if you're familiar with um, you know, more typical uh, web servers, you know, like uh, Apache or Nginx, they write every time someone visits the site, hits a page on the site, um, Apache or Nginx will write that page hit to a file, um, and a log file that's on the file system. And, and OpenEdX is no different. So every, every interaction that the student has on the OpenEdX site is written to a log. Um, not just page loads, but also JavaScript events. So if you, you know, if you click on a widget and it expands something, that can, that can also write something out to the tracking log. So, with that tracking, tracking log data, you can get a lot of insights into what your students are doing on the website, what material they're accessing, how long they're spending on that material, whether they're skipping material, um, which courses are the most popular, the ones that they're, they're accessing most frequently. Um, so taking that tracking data is and, and making sense out of it is a lot of work, which is what the, the edX analytics pipeline combined with the insights product allow you to do is they basically ingest all that all that tracking log data they and they take in the MySQL data and then <clears throat> they send those um, those jobs up to Hadoop Hadoop does a bunch of number crunching <laughs> to make sense of the data and then it sends it back to insights and stores that in MySQL so that's how you can you can take the tracking log data and, and make sense of it using insights but like I said in, in the presentation, there's also, you know, uh, MIT is using BigQuery, which is a product from, from Google, to take all those tracking logs and uh, do their, run their own anal analytics on it. Um, so the fact that you have access to that raw data is really powerful because you can, you can learn a lot of things about your students that you wouldn't otherwise be able to if you didn't have that data. All right, great. So thank you, Nate, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, please join us at the Open edX conference uh, next month at Stanford. Beautiful location. I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, a longer version of this, but dozens of other presentations also. Um, please uh, download the handout that's uh, available here, and then answer those two questions as, as you depart. And we'll let you know about the uh, July webinar uh, in about a month. So uh, take care, everyone. Great. Thanks, everybody.